<clears throat> what they would do is they would take somebody that's got smallpox, they would take a small bit of the scab from the smallpox, and then they would either <clears throat> inhale it or put a little uh, bit of that scab onto a cut. So they're essentially introducing smallpox to the individual. And of course the hope is that they survived that introduction. Sometimes they didn't. You know. But if they did survive that initial introduction, then they would be immune to smallpox for life. And so this was going back all the way uh, back to 1000 uh, AD. Well, a gentleman by the name of Edward Jenner had been observing milkmaids. And what he had noticed is that milkmaids often would come down with a condition called cowpox. Now, cowpox wasn't a, a life-threatening condition, and they generally recovered from it within a couple of days. But what he observed is it seemed that individuals, women that had come down with cowpox, were immune to smallpox. So with this theory, with this hypothesis, <clears throat> he took some uh, scrapings from a woman named Sarah Nelson, not, or Nelms, not that I need you to know her name necessarily, but I have it here. <clears throat> he took some uh, cowpox from her, and he got a young boy, he scratched the young boy, and he exposed the young boy to cowpox. Now, a couple weeks later, he takes the young boy and he exposes the young boy to smallpox. And the young boy survived the exposure to smallpox. He demonstrated that you could build an immunity using cowpox as a vaccine. Louis Pasteur is the one that coined the term vaccination. Vaca meaning cow. Wasn't too much longer after uh, Jenner's discovery that we started to immunize for smallpox. The royalty would, uh, having heard of this, would call <coughs> their physician there. And then instead of having the children all uh, immunized initially because you know they still weren't sure they had to help immunize first make sure that they survived then you have the children immunized and the rest of the individuals <clears throat> in 1979 we eradicated smallpox from the planet well not entirely I'm sure that there are a couple of labs uh, here in the United States and maybe over in Russia where there are strains of smallpox still, but there has not been a human case of smallpox since 1979. The reason that we were able to do that is that smallpox is restricted to the human population. No other animals get smallpox. And so when you have something that is restricted to the human population, it does lend itself to uh, potentially being eradicated. Anything that might be in the animal world you know, or in the environment, unlikely that you'd be able to eradicate them. You just couldn't get it out of the environment. That means then, HIV then potentially could be eradicated. We could stop the, the uh, spread of it because it is only in humans. Principles of immunization. <clears throat> there are, <clears throat> there is a naturally acquired immunization that can happen. This occurs when you are naturally exposed to an infectious agent. And it is how your immune system 
is developed over your lifetime through natural exposure of antigens. But we can also have artificially acquired immunity. And this is immunization. Now, you can have an active naturally acquired immunization, again, where you were exposed to an agent, an uh, antigen naturally, and your body now is responding and producing antibodies to it. So in this case here, You've got B and T cell activity. You're actually responding to the agent. But you can also have a passive naturally acquired immunity. A passive naturally acquired immunity happens to or happens when the mother transfers her protection to the child. So during pregnancy and, and shortly after birth, antibodies that the mother has been producing can cross the placenta and serve to protect the fetus. And then after the child is born, antibodies in the mother's milk can serve to protect the child against uh, disease. But this is passive because the child isn't making the antibodies. The antibodies are coming from the mother. They're naturally acquired, but they're her antibodies. So they're going to be short-lived. They're not going to protect the child forever. In fact, they're going to uh, eventually, probably within the first six months, be depleted. And if you are a mother, or if you've been around children, you know that <clears throat> it's not uncommon right around three to six months that you start to see your children develop colds and coffee and, and get those kinds of infections that their mother probably was protecting them from initially. But now as these antibodies are being completed, the child needs to get exposed so that it can now make its own antibodies. <clears throat> uh, artificial acquired immunity Again, you can have an active artificially acquired immunity. In this case here, <clears throat> you are injecting an agent that is stimulating B and T cell response. What's that? No. What I just say? Uh, yeah, yeah, that is vaccination. I'm sorry. Yes, that is vaccination. So you got you basically what you're doing is you're exposing the individual to uh, antigens, epitopes that will stimulate their immune system to produce antibodies. And an artificial passive immunity is one then where you are being given antibodies. The antibodies could be coming from, generally they're going to come from uh, uh, a serum, an anti-serum. Somebody else has produced them. It used to be other animals produced them. <coughs> we used to take them from horse serum. <coughs> Remember that um, hypersensitivity I mentioned to you, the uh, complex mediated hypersensitivity? Uh, you saw that a lot with individuals that were given artificial uh, immunity using horse serum. A lot of times the horse serum would, would cause that kind of complex to develop and you would see those being deposited in the skins and joints and that, that uh, sickness developed from it. I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop there tonight, and I will uh, pick up on this next time.
Those of you that have lab, if you want to start at 7.15, we can do that.